there was a warm welcome for Douglas. Up you come, Douglas. And uh, Douglas does a, a mighty open air work as well. So uh, I'm only out for a Saturday afternoon. This man's doing much more. Than that. So, Douglas, over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Nice to be here tonight and to uh, share with you. Um, I've never been here uh, for your, your meeting before. Um, I came here and I sat just over there and I enjoyed some nice cup of coffee and some things to eat uh, a few months back, but uh, never been to a meeting, so it's really nice to be here and to, uh, to share in that with you. And I thought that it might be good just to uh, tell you a little bit about who I am and explain uh, why I'm here. Um, I, it's great being on YouTube, it's a bit you can't see, but never mind. <laughs> That's all right. So, you know how they say that there are certain things that you that really, really stick in your memory? Like, um, they say, you know, where you were when, when JFK was shot. Well, I have no idea. I think it was before I was born. I don't know if it was actually, but I don't remember a thing about it. It meant nothing to me. It's probably me, boy. But uh, I do remember uh, other things. Like, I remember exactly where I was when uh, I heard the news that Princess Diana had been killed or had died. Um, I remember. Uh, where I was uh, when the, I heard the news that the planes had flown into the Twin Towers and I remember walking into somebody's living room that I was staying with at the time and uh, there it was on the TV in the morning and I thought they were watching a movie, you know, as you see these planes get in and then the, the man in the house is coming where it was and you're like, wow. Now, there are certain things that really stick in your mind, aren't there? And one of the things that sticks in my mind that relates personally to me, and these other things you might remember, but the, this relates personally to me, is I can remember as a wee boy, we moved house and we, we moved from Port Glasgow to uh, Glengarnock. You ever heard of Glengarnock? You never lived. No, it's just a wee village in Ayrshire. And uh, it used to be famous for making steel. But uh, on the, in August 1966, we moved to Glengarnock. My dad had changed his job. And our family all moved through there. And uh, I was just a, a wee boy at the time. And not long after that, um, I was getting settled in a new school. And I remember getting my homework to do. And I was to read a story out of a, a, you know, a book to, uh, to my mum. And so I read the story. And it was a, a man walking on the hills. He liked to go with his dog. And, and that was his big thing went, he just loved walking on the hills with his dog. And at the end of this short story, which was really to practice my reading, um, it asked the question, what was the most important thing for the man in the story? The most important thing was walking on the hills with his dog. Straightforward. And um, my mother asked me the question and I answered the question and that was fine. Then she said, but what's the most important thing in life? Kind of hard, but it's it really, isn't it? And um, I thought, well, maybe it's to have enough money to live. Um, but then again, if you've got money and you're not healthy, that wouldn't be good. You need good health as well. Um, and I was trying to think, what, what would be the most important? And she said, it's to know Jesus as your saviour. And she then proceeded to say, what about this? And do you believe in that? And do you do various things in the Bible? And I asked if I believed in it. And I said, oh yeah, I believe all that. And she said, well, you're a Christian then. And she marched me up the stairs to where my dad was putting the tiles in the bathroom. Because we're just going to house to He said, so he's, uh, he's putting his tiles in the bathroom. And she says to my dad, Douglas has just become a Christian tonight. And he said, oh, that's great. And I'm thinking, have I? I didn't know that. And then I didn't have to give it to I mean, it was just, you know, it was a wee boy, you didn't, you didn't say uh, anything against your parents. So uh, I thought, that's interesting. But I never really was very sure about it. And then later on, I don't know how much time there was in between, but there was a period of time in between. And I can remember lying on my bed at night thinking, I don't think I really am a Christian. I need Jesus in my heart. I never prayed, I never did anything. And so, there in my bed, I used the words of a children's chorus. We've already heard a children's chorus tonight, haven't we? About Jesus loves me, this I know. But I used a children's chorus 
that was into my heart, into my heart, come into my heart, Lord Jesus. Come in today, take sin away. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus. And then the second verse was, come into my heart, come into my heart, come into my heart, Lord Jesus. Come in today, come in to stay, come into my heart, Lord Jesus. Uh, and he did. And he changed the whole course of my life. And uh, he sent me on a course that was to take me away from the, the, the scene of wickedness and evil and all the rest of it, uh, and take me on a road towards his righteousness. The sanctification, if you understand what that is, that's a long process, so I'm not perfect yet. And it's uh, a long, long time ago since that event I just mentioned. But God saved me from an awful lot, and he's kept me uh, all these years right down there, and uh, he's still with me. And of course, I wanted to share my faith with other people. And when I was 13 years old, then uh, my parents were the house parents on a mission team. They were looking after the team. And with the, with the group of people, it was a, a, an organization called SCEM, Scottish Counties Evangelistic Movement. And um, they said that you had to be 15 years of age to be in their team. Well, I was only 13, but I was there because my parents were there. And I joined in with the team. And I started sharing my faith with other people. Uh, I gave a testimony at a youth meeting. I was going around the doors and talking to people in their homes. Uh, and giving them literature uh, and various things like that, helping out with the children's meetings and things. And so I began to share my faith. And when I went back home after that, uh, that mission, then my, my big brother said to me, he was going up to an open air in Glasgow, and he said, would you like to come? I go, oh yeah. Now I mean, 13 years of age, I went up to the big city, and uh, it was an exciting night. And uh, so I went, and week after week, we went up there to uh, have an open air to preach to the people in the centre of Glasgow. In these days, the pubs closed at 10 o'clock, and we would start our open air at half past nine. And then as the pubs were coming out, we were still there, uh, and the folks would come and listen. We were also right next to the ABC2 cinema. And depending on when the movie finished, um, quite often with the people coming out there as well and listening to the gospel getting preached on Dalhousie Street. It's just off Socky Hall Street and uh, famously, maybe you've heard of the, um, the Macintosh School of Art. Well, it's just at the top there. Uh, so that was kind of where we were. But we're right in the heart of Glasgow and preaching the gospel to people. And uh, eventually I would be getting involved in doing some of the preaching as well. I don't think I started when I was 13, but um, I was getting involved in that as well. But um, it was kind of interesting because as the years went on, well, I was no longer able to go to the open air uh, for various reasons. Um, I was living out in, uh, in Ayrshire uh, in Dolai, and I uh, still active in the church. And it was kind of to a point I was married, I had two kids, um, I worked in life assurance, uh, and they were always wanting me to do a bit more and a bit more and a bit more. And they wanted me to work weekends while I was boxing. I never ever worked on Sunday. Um, so I was boxing in that sense. But it, it was always, uh, you know, they want you to work extra nights, they want you to come in on a Saturday. And I'm like, what time do I spend with my children, my family? Um, I was involved in church things, so that was conflicting as well. And I was under pressure. I thought something's going to give. So what do you give up? You give up your family. Uh, or do you give up your church, or, or do you give up your work? Oh, the answer's obvious, isn't it? You just give up your work. So that's what, that's what eventually happened. But it took a while. But all the, as this was beginning to get the, the pressure zone was building, then God was speaking to me from Luke chapter 5, and where Jesus goes into the boat, uh, it was Simon Peter's boat, and he teaches the people that on the shore from, uh, from Peter's boat. And when he finished, he said to Peter, launch out into the deep for a catch. And we'll let down our nets for a catch. You see, and so, every time I read that, or I heard somebody preach on it, launch out into the deep, get out into the deep water. That got me right in my heart, because I was thinking, well, I'm just playing in the shallow, shallow, uh, shallow water here. Just skittling about, 
I need to get out into the deep. I don't know quite know how to do it. And I thought, well, maybe I should go to the Bible College. Maybe that would uh, open some doors for me. And I would, but you know, the way to the Bible College I applied to, um, it didn't work out. <coughs> and so while I was puzzling over that and what I was going to do about the whole thing, there was a man that used to work for the Open Air Mission, was in the same church as me at that time, a man called Willie Doherty. I don't know if some of you might have come across him in the days going by. But um, Willie went up, was in the same church, and one night I was going into the evening service, and there were half a dozen steps up to the church door, and I was walking up the steps, and this voice came behind me. I want a word with you. He had a really deep, gruff voice, and they said, <laughs> and I, I said, okay. Uh, he says, come round to the house after the meeting. Fine. So I sat all the way through that service thinking, wonder what I've done. How have I offended him? You know? And uh, wonder what I've done. Anyway, I went to the house and he says, you know what you should do? You should join the Open Air Mission. That's what you should do. And it hadn't even crossed my mind. I'd never thought about it. And so it took a wee while, but we got there, we prayed over it, we thought through the various things, we talked to some people we trusted, uh, and a few we didn't, uh, but we learned to. And um, we, uh, we eventually came to the point where the door was open to join the Open Air Mission. And when you think back, at the age of 13, I started doing Open Airs. And I mean, I hadn't even thought about joining the Open Air Mission, but I'd had all that training from way back then. Uh, and that was something that was useful, so it was a, a continuing thing. I also met my wife at an open air meeting as, uh, as we were preaching the gospel. And, and she started coming along, and uh, then she caught me or something. And so, <laughs> and then, uh, you know, so there, there's just a whole, whole series of things that were working there. And so, God's <laughs> saying, once you're into the deep water, trust me. And so, we did. We, um, gave up the, the office job in, in the insurance, went out to preach the gospel on the streets, and uh, that's what we've been doing ever since, from uh, 1997. So nearly 22 years, 22 years next month, or the one after. So uh, there we are, and kept by God's grace uh, in doing that. And we meet all sorts of interesting people. There's, uh, because everybody's out in the street, aren't they? I mean, folk go shopping, and that's where we normally go to the shopping precincts. And people have to go shopping, so we meet all kinds of people as we do that. And, and I thought tonight that uh, I'd let you see what, um, what we do on the street. I take my board with me. This is it here. Okay? So it's just behind me on the board. And um, I thought I'd let you see how our board talk uh, might work. So I've got my visuals. And uh, I've got them all here already. And they're, they're going to go on the board. And uh, so my first one is this one here. Now, if you're observant, you'll notice something. That is the same as what's on the big screen. Have you got the message? And so just in case that that was a wee bit small for you, um, I'll put it on the big screen so you can all see it and you'll see what it is. And um, it's on the board as well. I was also aware that the lights in here, and sometimes when you use these, the lights reflect on the laminate, and then you can't really see them. So it's on the big screen, you'll see exactly what it is. So uh, there it is. Bottom one. The bottom one. Thank you very much. So I nearly had to put my specs on there. <laughs> so there we are. That's what it is. And so first disc is on, and it's up there in the top left hand corner. Have you got a message? And uh, that's the title of my wee talk, that we'd, or one of the talks that we'd often do out in the streets to, uh, to try and get people's attention. Mobile phone talk. Have you got the message? Of course, it's not just mobile phones that you get a message on. Sometimes you get a message in other ways, don't you? And uh, it used to be that it was uh, all come through your letterbox. And as it came through your letterbox, you would uh, you'd go and you'd lift up the post. Don't get so much that way now, do it. But um, it used to be that that was the way it came all the time through the letterbox. And if it was your birthday, or it was coming up to Christmas or some other thing, uh, and all these cards are coming in, and it's, it's really quite exciting, isn't it? Uh, and, but it's the same with a text message on your phone, or uh, maybe it's coming through as a, an email, or maybe it's coming through in your Twitter feed or a Facebook notification or a, an Instagram thing or whatever it is. There's all sorts of ways of communicating, aren't there? Um, and this applies to any medium of communication, really, uh, I think. But when you get that, 
a message. When you know there's a message there, it might be an envelope that you've uh, that's landed on your doormat, or it might be a wee thing that comes up on the screen of your computer or your phone or something like that. Then you look to see who it's from. Do you do that? Before you even open it, you look at the envelope and you think, who's this from? Uh, and you try and work it out. You look at the postmark, uh, and uh, depending on who you think it's from, depends how keen you have to open it up. Sometimes you might see it's from the, the electricity people, and so you think, oh no, I don't want to open up that. That's a bill. Uh, so you, you put that to the side, and you think, I'll just leave that one. And other ones, you, you look at it and you think, oh, that's, uh, that's junk mail. That's just advertising that shop down the road, so I'm not too keen on looking at that. And you look at another one and you think, oh, that's my Auntie Jean's writing. Oh, I mean, you can't get it on fast enough because Auntie Jean always sends you a nice letter and uh, there's a wee card there that's going to get a wee 10 shilling note in it. 10 shillings? Whatever. Right? Fiver. And, uh, and two and six. Right. So, but you know what I mean? You, you, you get something in there and you think, there's a, there's a, maybe I should get to it and there's nice things to say and you want to know how she got. So, who sent it affects how you feel about it. And so, uh, I think that's a, an important thing. But the thing is, how do you, what's your response to that? You know, when you, you open it up, there's different ways that you might respond. There's different things you might do with the information that you've come, whether it's uh, in a bit of paper or whether it's electronically, there's different things you might do. If it's a junk mail, if it's somebody advertising something, you maybe just go straight to the recycle bin, or you maybe just hit the delete button on your device, and if it's gone, and disappeared, and uh, you can't get it back. Uh, that's it away. Uh, because you're not really interested in it. And off it goes. Sometimes, especially if it's um, something that's come through as a, an email, um, or maybe a text message just to apply to as well, but you might say, oh, I know somebody that would love to see that. Because there's loads of these jokes that go around, don't you? You ever see the jokes that go circling in the, uh, around the internet? And there's all sorts of them. And uh, you think, wow, ah, that, that made me laugh out loud. So uh, I, I think I know somebody would like it. But before you send it to them, you edit it, you change it a wee bit just to make it more personal to them. You might change the name of a football team or something like that so that it's more their thing and you edit it. <coughs> and that's another option of, uh, of what you might do as you, uh, as you, you look at your mail. You might think, well, okay, done that and uh, we'll move on to, uh, uh, where about that? Where about here? Edit, that's the one we should be at. And you, you want to change it and, move, and then send it on to other folk to adjust it so that it's better for them. Then, of course, you get people who say, well, I'm too busy just now. You know, if it's the post that's come through your letterbox, I'm just going out the door. So you lift it up, you set it in the mantelpiece, and then you walk away and you say, I'll, I'll look at that later on. Or maybe you've looked at it in your phone and you think, oh, I need, I need to deal with that. But uh, not just now. So you save it for, for later. And um, you say, I'll just shelve it for now, I'll come back to it later on, and I'll deal with it later. And uh, one of the things I've found is that often if you leave things for later, it gets to a point that it's so much later that you're, um, it's no longer relevant. It's gone out of date. You know, it's like when your pal texts you and says, I'm in, I'm in a town centre, I'm looking for a coffee at such and such a place. And... Um, Blackity Side Bar, that's where, that's where they'll meet you for a coffee. <coughs> We're waiting for a coffee at Blackity Side Bar, and um, I'll, I'll see you there at, at half past two. And then you, you, look and you notice you've got a, a message from your friends, but you don't open it. You just think, I'll save it for later, I'll look it up later uh, when I get back. And so you go back, you're back home, and then, oh, I forgot about that text. What did it say? Meet you for a coffee, half past two. It's six o'clock now. You've missed it. And so what do you do? You go back to the first one and you delete it. Because, no point. Your chance is gone uh, and you're too late. So we've got to watch with the, the delay one, haven't we? But of course, what the person wants you to do is to reply, to answer their message and to, uh, to respond to it. And that way, you, uh, you, you communicate with the person, you've connected with them and it, um, you can meet up for coffee or whatever it was that they wanted you to do. Uh, and, and that can work really well, can't it? 
So there's four things you need to do with the Macy's. I know there's other stuff you can do as well, but that's just that a little uh, sample there of things that you might do with uh, a message that comes to you. Now, that, I said, could work with your post or your electronic messages one way or another. But the thing is, God has sent a message to him. And that's the important thing, is that God has sent a message. And you might think, well, what kind of message is that? How did he send it? Did it come through my letterbox? Well, it might have done. Somebody might have posted you a wee leaflet through your letterbox to tell you about the, the love of God and about the Saviour. Somebody might have done that. And, and it can come with a bit of paper. Maybe you've got a Bible. Well, the message is in there and, it's, and it could be in paper form. But I've got the Bible on my phone as well. And uh, there's an app for your phone. There's a choice of them. Um, but you could get your version or Bible.com or um, there's the Gideon's new one and there's, there's various ones. Free. Don't cost you anything. If you've got your phone already, it's free to add in and uh, you can get the Bible on your phone. So it can come out electronically as well or you can get it on the internet um, with Bible.com or um, there's other things as well. Just type in Bible uh, and up it will come and, and you can look at the Bible uh, electronically. So God sent a message and it's, it's there for you. But do you know, God's message wasn't a bit of paper and it wasn't a, a set of digits that come through the internet. It came in person. And if you look at the wee picture there, you'll see it's a silhouette of three crosses on a hill. And that's symbolic of the message that God has for you. Three crosses on a hill. The center cross is the one that Jesus died on. And he died there for you. So what's the message about? Well, it's a message of love. The Bible says that while we were still sinners, God demonstrated his love for us in this. Christ died for us. That's a demonstration of God's love. That's how much he cares for you. When you love somebody, you do things for them. You give them gifts. You help them. You do things alike. God gave you the biggest gift that you could ever get. The person of his son dying on a cross for your sin. So it's a, it's a message of God's love. It's the message of God's forgiveness. Because Jesus died so our sin could be forgiven. So that our sins could be washed away. So that we could be made clean and made right in the sight of God. It's a, a great message. All your sins forgiven. Every single one. When you say all, then that's what the Bible says. That the blood of Jesus cleanses from all sin. So how many sins have you got left if you've been cleansed by the blood of Jesus? done. Cleansed by them all. And so it's a, a message of forgiveness. And you'll only find it in Jesus. You'll never get it anywhere else. And so, yeah, it's God's love. It's God's forgiveness. Uh, it's also for us. It, it tells us that we needed forgiven. God had to do something about our sin. Otherwise we'd still be in our sin and we'd be uh, be just condemned to the wrath of God. We'd, we'd have to suffer for the things we've done. And God didn't want that. God didn't want you to be condemned to an eternal judgment. He wanted you to be saved. And so we needed saved. God knew that. And so he comes and Jesus dies on the cross for our sin so that we can be saved. And God has done all that's needed for you to have your sins washed away, for you to be saved from your sins and sent on the road to heaven. God's done it all. He's done everything that's needed for that. And the cross of Christ is, uh, is another symbol of that, that we need to have our sins forgiven. It's a message of hope. It's an awful lot of hopeless people, aren't there? An awful lot of people that are filled with despair and they struggle and they turn to other things to try and help them. They maybe turn to alcohol, they maybe turn to drugs, or they maybe turn to different relationships, or they maybe turn to um, putting all their energy into their career, or, or they maybe turn to different things that they might turn to. But they're, they're unfulfilled. And they kind of feel as though life is pointless. <coughs> and they get more and more filled with despair. I mean, it seems to be the fact of today to talk about mental illness. And there's lots of people who really struggle with mental illness and with depression and things like that. You know, God didn't want us to live that way. He wanted us to be have a hope in life. He wanted us to have a future and to see the future and to go forward. 
And he didn't want us to go and run away from life. He wanted us to embrace life, eternal life, in his son, the Lord Jesus. And uh, there's a hope in the cross of Christ that nothing else can get. And so he wants you to have that, and there's hope in Christ. There's hope for the future. Better prospects for this life here, but more so for eternity. That's what really matters. And so that's another reason that Jesus came into the world, was to bring hope and eternal life to the people that trust in him. All of that and a whole lot more is uh, summed up in that image that's on the screen there, a silhouette of the three crosses, Jesus in the middle, and of course Jesus ought to be in the middle of our lives too. So what do we do with the message for that? How do you how do you respond to that message about God and his love that's shown towards you? I mean I, I don't know how that makes you feel because you know it's a great message. But do you accept the message? Do you receive the Saviour? Or do you reject it and what do you do with it? Well, there's four things that I said we might do with other messages that, uh, that come to us. And the same things might apply to this message that God has sent. Now I said that uh, your response to the message depends on who sent it. Right? If it's your auntie Jean, you're opening it up to see what that is because you'll have to get a, a new letter from your auntie Jean. But if it's, a, if it's a bill, you're not so keen. Well, when it's God, the eternal God, shouldn't we be delighted that he sent a message? We should be. And yet, do you know what some folk do? They delete it. They say, I'm not having any of that. And they decide, I'm just going to ignore it and I'll, I'll not bother with it. And so they say, well, no God for me. Well, the Bible has something to say about that. The Bible tells us that it's the fool who says in his heart, no God for me. The fool. Now, <laughs> I know that there's people who are professors in university, and they say, no God, that God doesn't exist. They might be very intelligent in the, you know, the things of this world. They might have passed their exams, lots and lots of exams. And they might be able to have good logic and reasoning. But when it comes down to the fact that they say that they don't want God, God's got a message for them. You're a fool. You're a fool. There's no wisdom in rejecting God. And the, the fact is that we know God is there. There are plenty of things that tell us. The sun, moon and stars tell us that God exists. The more that science investigates the things that are in the natural world, the more we discover that, yes, God does exist. There must be somebody who has created all that. The complexity of the, our human bodies is absolutely amazing. The Bible says we are fearfully and wonderfully made. Who could not? You know, it's amazing the things that God has done. And it's only relatively recent times that scientists have discovered DNA and have unlocked the code Things up, x files uh, They've unlocked the code to, uh, to to work out our DNA, and not only that, they started tampering with it as well in some cases. And so, you know, it, it's quite clear that there is somebody who's put information in there. And there's lots of people who have been listening to the message of uh, Professor Richard Dawkins, and this he says you can either believe in God or you believe in science. Uh, and you can't believe in them both because they're in conflict, he says. But they're not. And he's causing great confusion. This week, um, I was down at, uh, in England, and they were telling me about uh, a wee boy who's uh, stopped doing science homework for his, uh, his class at school. And they were trying to get to the bottom of why he wouldn't do his homework in the science class. And what they discovered was this. He had been told he can either believe in God or science. And since he believed in God, he says, there's no point in me doing the science. I may as well know what I'm doing homework. <laughs> that wasn't a great move, really. But you see the confusion it causes when people make statements like that and teach the young people things that simply are not true. I love science, and I firmly believe in God. Science does great things. I love the fact that when you switch the kettle on, the electricity somehow goes into that kettle and these electrons move through the coil of, uh, that's in the bottom of it 
and the heat up and then at exactly 100 degrees Celsius the kettle boils and that's just perfect for making a cup of tea. Do you like that? I like that. I can't be a cup of tea, can you? And so, you know, <laughs> the kettles are good. And so, you know, the, the, these things, scientists have done great things. But they've not just proved God by any stretch of imagination. And it's okay to believe in real science. Not the hypothetical stuff that, um, that people come up with and say, you know, about millions of years ago that the, the world came about by a big bang and then we evolved into wherever we are now. It's a load of nonsense. And there's no, I mean, the evidence that they call it, that they have, that they have for that, is the same evidence that creation scientists use to say that we were created. It's the same group of fossils. In fact, often the creation scientists use more of the, the data that's available for evidence than the other folk, because the other folk have been selective, because there's things they don't like that, uh, that are in there. I'm digressing off my subjects a bit, I'll come back. The Bible says it's a fool who chooses to ignore God. And when you think on it, Jesus came to be the saviour, he came to forgive you for your sin, to give you eternal life, and set you on the road to heaven. It's a fool that would ignore that person, isn't it? It's like somebody out in the ocean that's drowning, and the, the lifeboat has come, and they, uh, they throw the life belt out to them, and they say, catch the life belt, and we'll pull you up and into the boat. And they say, ah, it's all right, I'll just do it my way. And they're hundreds of miles from anywhere, and they'll certainly drown. I'd be a fool, but they could be rescued. And that's what people who, who decide that they'll uh, ignore God are doing. Then you get folk who change it. And they, they change the truth of God into lie. If you've got truth, and then you change it, then you've got a lie, haven't you? Because when you think of it, if you've got two add on two is four, right? And we know that's the case. Two add on two is four. <laughs> but if you say, no, it's five. It's not true, is it? You can change it all you like, but it's not true. And it doesn't matter how loudly you shout it. It doesn't matter what publications you publish it in. It's not going to make any difference. It's still not true. So if you take something that's true and change it, it's no longer true, it's a lie. Now there's people that take the Bible, the work of God, and they say, I'll change it. And you might be sitting there thinking, I've never changed the Bible, what are you talking about? Now, some people have written their own Bible, or their own sacred book, so-called, and, um, well, there's no point in changing it, is there's no point in writing another one. And so uh, that's a waste of their time, and it just leads everybody <coughs> astray. But there's quite a lot of people change the Bible for themselves. You know, when the Bible says, that your good works will not get you into heaven, that you're saved by God's grace alone. And then people say, ah, I've always done the best I can, I've never done anybody any harm, I've, all, I've lived a good life really, and I think if anybody's going to get into heaven, it'll be me. And people say that. But that's not what the Bible says. So don't go changing what the Bible says. Accept it for what it is. Believe it, follow it. And trust it and you'll discover that it's trustworthy and it's absolutely true and you don't need to go changing it. You'll not make it into any better. All you do is spoil it if you change it. So don't do that. Then you get folk who decide they're going to shelve it. They're going to uh, wait and uh, wait for another day. Wait till some events pass. Now, I had uh, I've encountered people who say they'll, they'll trust in God when they're old. There's, when I'm on my deathbed, some people say, then I'll call to God and get saved, and uh, I want to live my life first. Well, I think that's a, that's a bit of a, a cheeky thing to say. Don't you think cheeky towards God? Insolent towards God? Can, can you imagine on a nice hot day, you need to use a good imagination for us, to have a good hot day. Now imagine you're on a nice hot day, and you're out for a walk and uh, the sun's blazing down, it's really hot and the sweat's coming off you and you're just so hot and uh, there's a, a nice place you could go in to get a drink and so uh, your friend that's with you says, I'll get you a drink. Oh, would you? That'd be great. So you go in and your friend orders the drink, then takes the drink and then goes, 
and if there was just a wee half inch left in the bottom of the glass, then your friend hands it to you and says, there's your drink. You'd be looking going, hey, but you drunk it. Don't give me the dregs. And yet people want to do that with God. They want to live their life and give God the last five minutes. God wants your life from now, not from five minutes before you die. He wants your life from now. And it's an insult to say, I'll just give him the last five minutes. So don't insult God. Don't insult God. And don't wait for the last five minutes out. I mean, when are you going to die? Do you, do you know what date it is? Have you marked it in your diary? I've had one or two folks say to me, would you speak at my funeral? And I'd say, aye, that'd be fine. What date is it? <laughs> Do you know what? They don't know. <coughs> because they don't know when they're going to die. And it might be soon and it might be in a long time. But none of us knows. And um, I had a friend who, she, uh, she got cancer and uh, she wasn't very well at all. And um, it was terminal. And uh, she would talk about her death coming up. And things that she wanted at a funeral. And things that she wanted her family to do after she'd gone and so on. And uh, she'd be talking about when she would die. And then she would go, but you might die first. You might die first. Now that hasn't happened. But the thing is, none of us know, do we? And earlier on we heard about somebody that uh, was taken quickly, unexpectedly. And it happens all the time. And I, I spoke at a funeral a couple of weeks ago of a, a friend of mine, a former work colleague, um, who'd was retired, 72 years of age, and he had a, an accident in his garden, and, and it crushed him and he died. Don't wear the blue, you don't expect that, he was a fit and healthy person. There's lots of examples of people that die early. You read the papers and you'll see several of them, you listen to the news on the TV, they're there as well. You talk to the folk in your, your street, they'll tell you what somebody do. Everywhere. And I hope you, you live a long life. Uh, I don't want you to die early on some tragedy, but the thing is, we never wrote any. And so, now is the time. The Bible says not to boast yourself of tomorrow. Don't boast of tomorrow, because you don't know what a day will bring. Don't say, tomorrow we'll go to such and such a place. Instead, say, if it's the Lord's will, we'll do that. We don't know. And so we should always be ready. We should always be prepared and always be ready to meet God. And uh, not to leave it until it's too late. Because do you remember what I said about the, the shelving it, the save it for later thing? If it was a text that came in, that there often comes a point that's too late. And the, the opportunity that that text was given you is gone. And your option is just to delete it because you were gone. It can be the same thing if you're... Uh, saving it up for later and saying, well, I, I'll deal with this, this issue about salvation and be right with God at a later stage. But there comes a point it's too late. And effectively what you've done is delete it. You've ignored the God that could save you. And the Bible says, how shall we escape if we ignore such a great salvation? It's a rhetorical question because there's no answer. <coughs> there is no escape if you ignore the great salvation. So we need to accept it and we need to accept it now. And of course, what God's looking for is for uh, an answer. He's wanting somebody to respond. And he's wanting you to respond. When Jesus, he uh, walked there, they often taught the people in parables, stories about everyday things. And um, he would give them a, a special meaning to help people understand about God and how they would relate to God. And one day, he told a story about two people going up to the temple to pray. And as these two men went to the temple to pray, Jesus described them. He said one was a, a, a Pharisee, one was a, a religious man, a religious Jewish man. He uh, would always keep the law. He'd try and do what was right. He'd try and make sure other people did what was right too. And so he's a good religious man. The other person was a, not a religious person, but a rascal. He was a tax collector. And in the Jewish time of Jesus, the um, they collected the money, the tax money from the Jews, but it went to the Romans because the Romans were occupying their country. So the tax collectors were hated, and often 
they would take a little bit extra for themselves. And so they were hated even more and despised for doing that kind of job. And that's the the person that was going. So you get a religious man and a rascal. They get into the temple. The religious man stands there. And he, he says in a loud voice that everybody could hear, God, I thank you that I'm a, a good person. I thank you that I keep the law. I thank you, God, that I, I give a tenth of all I get. Which is in accordance with the law as well. And I, I thank you, God, that I give to the poor people. I thank you, God, that I'm a good person and I'm not like that man over there. Then he points to the rascal, the tax man. And away he went home. But he pleased with himself, he came to the temple and prayed. And Jesus said, God didn't listen to his prayer. But the tax man, this rascal, he goes in, and instead of standing in the middle and speaking in a big loud voice for everybody to hear, he stands in the corner, he looks at the floor, uh, and he says, God be merciful to me, for I'm a sinner. And he went home. And Jesus said, that man went home right with God. He was the one who was humble, not proud and boastful. He's not boasting about all the good things he's done. He's ashamed of what he's done. And he says, God be merciful to me, for I'm a sinner. And God heard that, that prayer. God always hears that prayer. And there's maybe somebody in this meeting tonight, or maybe somebody that's listening on the radio, or watching on YouTube or whatever, maybe somebody that needs to say that prayer too. God be merciful to me, for I'm a sinner. And when you say that, in, with a humble spirit, and calling out to God, God hears, and he answers that prayer. And he wants you to pray it. He wants you to call to him. That's why Jesus died on the cross. That's what the three crosses on the hills all about. Jesus in that centre cross died there for our sin so that God could show mercy to us. We don't deserve it. If we deserved it, it would be justice. But we don't deserve it. It's the mercy of God and it comes to those who are humble. And the people who are humble, God lifts them up and takes them to be with himself on a day to come. We uh, give this message to the people on the streets, but it's just as appropriate for people here or people wherever they are in the world listening. And it's appropriate for you, whoever you are. God be merciful to me for another sinner. Call on God and he'll show you mercy. We offer the Gospel of John to people on the streets and uh, I can do that for the folks here that are met in this room. I've got uh, several copies here on the table just beside me and when the meeting's finished and you're getting your tea, then by all means go and take one. And you're welcome to, to read the Gospel of John and you'll find out who Jesus is and how that you can believe in him and have eternal life. And so you, you'd be very welcome to have that. For other folks that are listening, Go and find the Bible somewhere. I gave you a clue earlier about the Bible. You can look on the internet, uh, bible.com, and it'll give you the Bible on there. Or maybe you want to uh, find it somewhere else, that's okay. Or go on to the, the Gideon app. If you want to download an app onto your, your device, your phone, whatever, then uh, go on there and you can get the Bible on there too. Read the Gospel of John and find out who Jesus is and discover that he is the one who gives eternal life and he wants you to have it too. Maybe there's folk here tonight that are interested in the work of the, the Open Air Mission and what we do in the streets. Um, our magazine's there if you want to uh, take that and have a read at it yourself. you find reports from different men in the mission and uh, some of the people have met and there's a little prayer guide as well and you can pray for us uh, as you go as well. So thanks for listening and God bless you. Thanks, people, so much. Um, it was wonderful just to see all those things going up on the board and the work that goes on out in the open streets is tremendous. I did say to you that I had a second reading from the Lord uh, for you tonight, and uh, woe unto me if I don't deliver it. 
and who shall be delivered. <coughs> it's Job 39, Job 39. And uh, whenever I ask the Lord for readings, I ask the Spirit of the Lord to help me to use my fingers and thumbs to open the scripture to speak to you through the word. So what's going on in the world today God is not getting frustrated about it. He's got it all under control. Don't you worry. Just you put your trust in him and he will deliver you in his way, his path. Okay? So no matter what's going on, just put your trust in the Lord. <clears throat> and this I see the Lord speaking to us here through this word in Job 39. And the Lord will use every word in his Bible to get the message across to you about to put the trust in him. Knowest thou the time when the wild goats of the rock bring forth? Or canst thou mark out when the hinds do calf? Canst thou number the uh, months that they fulfill? Or knowest thou the time when they bring forth? They bow themselves, they bring forth their young ones, they cast out their sorrows, their young ones are in good liking, they grow up with corn, they go forth and return not unto them. Who has set out the wild ass free? Or who has loosened the bands of the wild ass? Whose house I have made the wilderness and the barren land his dwellings. He scorneth the multitude of the city, neither regardeth he the crying of the driver. The range of the mountains is his pasture, and he searches after every green thing. Will the unicorn be willing to serve thee, or abide by thy crib? Canst thou bind the unicorn with his band in the fur? Or will he harrow the valleys after thee? Wilt thou trust him because his strength is great? Or wilt thou leave thy labor to him? Wilt thou believe him that he will bring home thy seed and gather it into thy barn? Givest thou the goodly wings unto the peacocks, or wings unto the feathers, or unto the ostrich, which leadeth her eggs in the earth, and warmeth them in the dust, and forgetteth that thy foot may crush them, or that the wild beast may break them? She is hardened against her young ones, as though they were not hers. Her labor is in vain without fear, because God hath deprived her of wisdom. Neither hath he imparted to her understanding. What time she lifted up herself on high, she scorneth the horse and his rider. Hast thou given the horse strength? Hast thou clothed his neck with thunder? Canst thou make him afraid as a grasshopper? The glory of his nostrils is terrible. He paweth the, in the valley. He rejoices in his strength. He goeth on to meet the armed men. He mocketh at fear and is not affrighted. Neither turneth he back from the sword. The quiver rattled against him, the glittering spear and the shield. He swalloweth the ground with fearness and rage. Neither believeth he that it is the sound of the trumpet. He said among the trumpets, Ha ha, and he smelled the battle far off. Thou thundered of the captains and the shouting. Doth the hawk fly by the wisdom and stretcheth her wings towards the south? Doth the eagle mount up? at thy command, and make her nest on high. She dwelleth and abideth on the rock, upon the crag of the rock, and the strong place. From thence she seeketh the prey, and her eyes behold afar off. Her young ones also suck up blood, and were the slain of, there she is. That's this Job chapter 39. <coughs> The Lord's in charge of all things. He created all things. He created you, me, and the whole world, the whole universe. And everything is set in his time 
and will come to place in this time. And as I say, don't you get way too concerned what's going on about. The most important thing for us is to sow seed. It's the springtime. Thousands of seeds is going in at the moment. The gospel seed must go in. Must go in. And it must be covered with prayer. Because the Lord tells you clearly, immediately the enemy came to take it away. But if it was covered by prayer, by the Holy Spirit of God, that enemy can't touch it. He can't touch it. And that seed will lie dormant until the Lord says, now is the time. If no one told us about the gospel, how would we be saved? You've got to receive the seed. You've got to receive the gospel. I received it as a young boy. The seed lay dormant for all ten years. Fifty years I sat in church, church membership, and everything else. But then I walked into the light. Jesus is known as the light of the world. And what happens when the light comes in? Darkness must go immediately. Must go immediately. It can't hang about. There's no strength in the darkness when the light comes in. You've got the message. Praise be to God what he's doing. The readings today on uh, Salvation Street was Jeremiah chapter 3. So if you remember that, you can leave that there this weekend. Jeremiah chapter 3. There he's telling you about um, how the people have went away. Yeah? He tells you in that scripture about a wife leaving her husband and, and to play the harlot. The Lord says, you played the harlot with me. And he's still there. Calling them back. Calling them back. The next reading was Ecclesiastes chapter 9. Mighty scripture readings from the Lord telling you about the word of God and man and all his wisdom. He knows nothing if he doesn't fear the Lord. Because whenever you fear the Lord, the word of the Lord is, that was your first sign of wisdom. So praise be to God for that. Charles, would you uh, like to open and tell the people about our next meeting? Okay. Well, it's, well, it's uh, good to see so many with us today. When I was standing near the door, someone came in and said, there's a lot of strange faces in here tonight. I didn't know quite what to make of that. <laughs> but a lot of new faces, and maybe it's your first time. And of course, we do give you um, a really warm welcome in that case. Good to have Douglas with us too. We've shared, I think, in many, many an open air meeting <coughs> at Clyde Bank and the talk of High Street. I must confess, it's the first time I've heard this one. Yeah. So that's, that's good. And uh, the message, of course, is the most important thing, isn't it? We're not here for just fun and we're not here just to have another Saturday evening. We're here because we believe God has called us to a work in the gospel and because of that we believe that uh, that work is being blessed. I think just the numbers that are here tonight, we know that. And it's amazing the number of places and unexpected places that God is really blessing. Now, next month, uh, the 27th of April, we're always apart from Apart from December, we're always here on the first, sorry, the last, the last Saturday uh, in the month. And that, of course, is if God wills too. And on the 27th of April, uh, uh, Derek Maxwell uh, will be with us. Uh, uh, Derek is the director of the Slavic Gospel Association. Um, he comes up to Kelty, never mind what, among the Eastern Europeans and so forth. And uh, we, we know him very well. I was trying to think of a word to try and encourage you to come. Um, and the word that came across my mind was really quite simple. I would urge you to come. I would really urge you. I'll tell you why. Derek is not only an outstanding speaker. And uh, the report he gives is, is really unbelievable. Because I received a letter from him some time ago that said... Uh, and under the, the, the banner for the letter, <clears throat> it said this. It said, taking the gospel to the darkest and most dangerous parts of the earth. That's what happens. But, unbelievably, God is blessing the earth too. You would really be surprised how God is blessing. Many, especially young folks, are being saved. And they're not being brought into 
uh, some kind of uh, a game room or some kind of uh, a thing that's easy going for them, they're taken right to Bible college. And uh, again, he'll have plenty to say on that. Please, uh, again, I'll use the word urge. That's a nice way to put it, isn't it? We urge you to come uh, and join with us. That's the 27th of April. Then on the 25th of May, Minister in Song, who have been here now, this will be their third visit. They're exceptionally good as far as the music side and also the preaching side goes, and testimony too. And we look forward to seeing them, God willing, on the 25th of May. On the 29th of, I'll just go down a few months, on the 29th of June, uh, Pastor Hugh McMillan will be with us. Now, Hugh was here in December, and uh, I, I, I visited one of the travelling sites uh, in Morgelli yesterday with the Gospel, and uh, a man who Robert knows, in fact, does a wee bit business with him, he came with one of the caravans, uh, uh, all smiles, and he says, we've got it. We've got it, I says, and that's what the salvation you were speaking about. <laughs> but I knew you had salvation anyway, but that's a different thing. He says, oh, we've got it. He says, I says, you've got what? He says, we've got permission to cool down the old church in Cowdenbeath, and we've got permission to build a brand new church there. We're looking for somewhere to meet. Now, here's somewhere, and Robert will testify to that. Uh, we've been a good number of times, of course, in the past, uh, especially with working beside these dear folks, and uh, it's standing room only. That, that, that's about the size. In fact, I think I mentioned the, the other month that uh, uh, Hugh was telling me that one of the prayer meetings a few weeks ago, they had 91 folks at the prayer meeting. Uh, does your church have 91 folks at the prayer meeting? Anyway, they have permission, and God is blessing them greatly again in the salvation of souls. Uh, on the 27th of July, uh, George Barclay from Northern Ireland, I think George is another farmer, am I right? Mm -hmm. He's another farmer, Robert. And uh, George will be here with the girls group to sing. They've been here uh, on a, a number of occasions and to try to get along here uh, probably for two years. <coughs> and it's a couple of years now since they've been and we look again in the will of God to that. Uh, meeting with George and the girls. Then the last one I'll just announce is the 31st of August. Dr. George Mitchell will be with us. Now George has been here uh, before and he would be here. I see Christine smiling away there. Uh, George would be uh, here uh, again, God willing, on the, um, the 31st of August. I don't think there's anybody that I know. Uh, I've known George for a lot of years now. I don't think there's anybody I know who has done more for posterity as far as the, the gospel is concerned and uh, George started his, I was going to say apprenticeship, but I better say his early preaching along there at Buckhaven uh, Baptist Church uh, and, and is a great testimony too. However, that's the meetings, uh, the 31st of August, Dr. George Mitchell. Please pray that God will bless the work that Douglas is involved in. I know being involved in it too that there's a lot of hostility against the gospel. There's a lot of people who just don't have any idea at all what the gospel is. I spent uh, a couple of weeks, uh, a few years ago, going through uh, a little village along here called St. Moran's with the gospel, uh, and uh, I knocked at every door uh, and handed over literature. And the man came to the door one day, and I was really shocked. He said, told me he, he was a, 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 a an official position in his church. He had been a church member for about 60 years. And he went over all this. Uh, and when I tried to explain the gospel to him, he said this. He said, tell me something. Is this a new thing? Wow. And there's no good I could have crept underneath his door. Is this a new thing? Now, you know, if we have church buildings and we have ministers and we have folk that are taking official positions with the word of God, and not delivering it properly or at all, then great judgment, I'm sure, is yet to come. You think of the importance of reaching out and reaching out for God. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Thanks for that, Charles. So, uh, the girls have made lots of sandwiches, so please stay for supper, okay? Uh, you know, um, 
I assured this with Charles at the Wee Brewer meeting on Monday night. Um, <coughs> I, I was speaking to the Lord about, Lord, holy. Lord, you are holy. And, um, and I says, Lord, I know what you told me about the Bible. Um, but I says, Lord, holy. Then it just came to me and I clapped and I knew it was from the Lord. So, Holy Bible, H O L Y B I B L E. Humble ourselves. Love Yahweh. Best instruction before leaving earth. Humble ourselves. Love Yahweh. That's God's name, Yahweh. Best instruction before leaving earth. We're going to be in the Word of God because that is God's Word. And whenever you read it, faith comes by hearing, hearing the Word. You know, people may say all sorts of things, but whenever you put the sword to them, the Word of God, that's it. It is written. It is written. We're going to closing him. Scotland on fire, I hope. <laughs> Uh, for any who haven't heard it before, um, we do hope you enjoy it. And the ones who have heard it, I want you to sing out because the world will be listening, okay? <laughs> <laughs>